for hosting today, and uh, thanks to Brent and to everybody at Bio and the industrial section. This is a fantastic turnout, and there's a lot of very positive energy here. It's uh, it's great. Uh, for those of you who were here uh, last year, it was a little bit of a different vibe, and and it's it's really nice to see that everybody is emerging and ready to stand up new technologies and ready to drive forward the bioproducts industry. It's exciting for me as well. Uh, I'm going to speak just for a few minutes about Solzheim. And Solzheim is principally a renewable oil production company. It's, it is how we think of ourselves. There was a time when we thought of ourselves as an algae fuel company, and then we realized ultimately we needed to define ourselves by a product. And we realized that if you're making oil, then you're fundamentally able to produce a much wider array of products than fuel. So we started to think of ourselves as a renewable oil production platform to make oils that can go into fuels, can go into chemicals, can go into food, and even into cosmetics. And we have the ability to tailor these oils and to produce them using a standard industrial fermentation platform. This is a platform that's actually quite familiar to the industrial section at Bio, folks know. We actually use big stainless steel tanks, and we put microalgae in those tanks, and we grow the algae in the dark, and we've developed what I believe is the first substantial biomass sugars to oil platform for the different kinds of products that I've mentioned. So you think about a technology to put microalgae in standard industrial fermentation equipment and feed a wide variety of different plant sugars, and that's our core technology. And then you layer on top of that the ability to make oils that can replace both petroleum and vegetable oil. And we work on producing oils that can attack markets that are filled right now by each of those kinds of oils. So specifically, petroleum replacements can go into renewable transport fuels, but also into a wide variety of different petrochemicals and vegetable oils, also, by the way, used in transportation fuels, for those of you who have ever put biodiesel in your car, fame, but also oleochemical and food applications. And this really gives us a very broad opportunity to partner across the value chain and to take tailored oils into multiple markets. We view this as the most important way to attack these markets because oil is a basic building block for life. We use it to fuel our transportation, and we also use it to fuel our bodies. We eat fried food, some of us, some of us try not to, and we also have a, a wide variety of products with baking oils in it as well. So it's a phenomenally broad, we kind of think of it as a blue sky platform. It's a platform where we're literally replacing oil. Petroleum comes today from finite resources. It is fossil fuel. It is not renewable as much as people want to tell you otherwise. And I'm not going to get into an argument with the many people at Solazon who come from the big oil industry because we could argue all day long about what oil is going to do tomorrow, next week, next month. But I can tell you, it's going up eventually. It's going up eventually because it is a finite resource. And yes, there are natural oils out there, but there's a finite quantity of suitable land for some of those natural oils, and that's because our planet actually grows carbohydrates better than it does natural oils. So there are challenges with things like palm oil from a sustainability platform. In the U.S., we obviously are importing a lot of the oil that we use every day. We have a, a small fraction of the world's proven reserves, and we're using actually a pretty large fraction of the oil that gets consumed in a daily, on a daily basis, and a very, very unstable supply chain. This is a picture I think you've probably seen at many, many conferences, but I think it gives everyone who looks at it a little bit of the shivers anyway. I'm talking about the one on the right, although they both could. There's a significant need for a stable, renewable source of fuel. It is an energy security imperative as well as an environmental imperative. Solozyme's platform, as I noted, is a standard industrial fermentation platform, but it's actually an interesting one because we use microalgae, which it turns out 
And we didn't know this when we started developing this technology back in 2003, 2004. But it turns out that microalgae are actually very tolerant of a wide variety of different contaminants and surprisingly can eat plant sugars from a wide variety of biomass sources. So, for instance, we've done quite a bit of work producing cellulosic diesel fuels, miscanthus, switchgrass, bagasse, stover, even wood chips. We do use corn when we're making food applications, and we do use sugarcane also in fuels and some of our chemical applications. And we produce tailored oils that go again into all of these markets. And we're able to leverage a completely pre-existing production supply chain. And I can't stress enough the importance of this if you really want to commercialize your technology. It really needs to fit into the supply chain at every single branch. And what you're looking at here is actually interesting. Some of these pictures are better than others. But the interesting thing about this complete value chain here is that these are all pictures of equipment that we use today. We don't, we don't well, the helicopter we haven't used personally, but we're hoping to see some of those flying soon. But that's a real fermenter running Solozyme's process. That's a real refinery being used to convert into inspect fuels. And that's a real distribution platform that in that picture is either lo loaded with diesel or jet fuel. And if you come to Solozyme, you can ride in a variety of unmodified diesel vehicles that are running on 100% solar diesel. This is incredibly important. The agricultural product mix on the planet, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, is that most of this planet, most of the arable land on this planet, is producing carbohydrates. Almost 90%. And the nominal 13% that's growing oils is actually misleading, because more than half of that is actually producing soy, which is largely a protein crop. Our planet is actually more well suited to produce carbohydrates on a BTU per acre basis than it is to produce natural oils. And if you look on the right side, you're looking at a dramatically growing demand curve for natural oils, and you're also looking at a growing demand curve for petroleum. Our technology is the first technology that actually can arbitrage from all of those carbohydrates on all that arable land, plus all of the carbohydrates that come in the form of cellulosic materials produced on non-arable land arbitraged into oils that fit into our completely pre-existing infrastructure. Now, I've said this a few times because people always ask this question. The feedstock you use does matter. The best technologies and the most interesting technologies that have been developed over generations some of which, with a lot of help from DOD, like the internet and semiconductors, can be used in wonderful and powerful ways, but can also be used negatively. And that goes across into biofuels and bioproducts as well. However, just because something can be used in a way that's not beneficial, doesn't mean that we should shoot it down out of the gate. And the reality is, there is a lot of sustainable feedstock out there that is available. And we've demonstrated, uh, working with uh, a company called Lifecycle Associates that also does work for California, um, AB32, that using a variety of different available feedstocks, we can uh, more than amply meet Section 526 with greenhouse gas reductions of uh, over 85% versus petroleum-based fuels. So there's a great opportunity there. I'm not going to spend time on the key insights from military leadership because I think Chris did a much better job at that, and, and so I'm going to move past that. But I heard an interesting question at the uh, DOD session today, which, which was somebody pointing out, I hear a lot of challenges with doing work in Hawaii. What are the reasons to do work in Hawaii? Well, I think this is a pretty good map that explains why Hawaii is an interesting place to produce biofuel. That dark line is oil coming from the Middle East and Asia. Now, I, I hope that never again are we in a position where Hawaii is the front line. I think everybody does. But ultimately, Hawaii's military is an important, important asset for our country. And you can see here that a lot of the fuel 
that we're using here to protect ourselves is coming from the east, which Hawaii is also here to help protect us from. So this is just an example of why. And there are many more examples, you can find them all over the US and, and territories and, and even other parts of the world where we have bases. But this is just one example of the why for biofuels. Now, we've been fortunate, we've been, we've been working with the uh, Department of Defense, specifically DLA, Energy, and the Navy for a few years now. We've, uh, we've signed three different contracts, I think, at this point. Uh, one was a naval dissolute fuel for ships, and that was a little over 20,000 gallons we delivered last summer. Another was another 1,500 gallons of a renewable jet fuel, also delivered last summer. Both were completed on time and delivered in their entirety to the Navy for testing and certification, which is ongoing today. And a little bit after the conclusion of those deliveries, we were fortunate to sign a significantly larger contract, which we're executing against right now, and that's for an additional 150,000 gallons. Now, I think the problems facing us as a, as a planet with respect to uh, resource depletion, environmental issues, and as a country related to energy security are large, and I think it's going to take a lot of solutions. And it's one of the things that's really exciting about coming to a conference like this. There's a lot of wonderful technology in the room, and there's a lot of very, very driven people that are dedicated to getting this technology commercial to help the United States and to help the world. But I'm also proud to say that our last deliveries this summer comprised the largest, as far as I know, and, and somebody can can tell me that I'm not right here, the largest non-alcohol microbial biofuel deliveries in history. And, and if that sounds a little bit like a commercial for Solazon, it should be. The really interesting point here is the customer for this delivery was actually the US government, and more specifically, was DLA Energy and the Navy. And I don't think a lot of people a few years ago ever would have thought that the customer the customer for the largest delivery of a non-alcohol microbial biofuel would be the Department of Defense. But this shows real serious forward thinking on the part of a lot of people who are really driven to help solve our energy security issues. The Navy specifically has been talking about their increased demand for low carbon biofuels that meet Section 526. And this is a very exciting bogey, I would say, for lots of people in this room, and we should be paying attention. These are strong market signals and they matter. We're proud to be the source of the uh, fuel in the Riverine Command Boat, and that's Admiral Cullen holding up our fuel on the left over there and speaking about the fact that this is the future this kind of fuel, and I think there will be plenty of providers of this kind of fuel, but I'm proud that we were the ones that supplied the fuel for these tests. In interest of time, I'm really going to wrap up here to say that we're doing a lot of work and we're also looking forward to flight tests in the coming year with the Navy as well. We're partnered across the entire value chain, and this is a very, very important discussion, all the way from feedstock with companies like Bungie, Blue Fire, Abengoa. On the refining side, we've been working for years with Chevron, and we've been working with UOP on a lot of our DOD contracts, and on the distribution side as well. And, and it really takes all of this in order to bring these new technologies to scale and to market relevance. So we're really happy to say that there are many big incumbents in the space who have serious assets, both in the form of steel on the ground and cash to spend, that care enough to be involved in these kinds of partnerships. I'm going to skip this in the interest of time, and I'm going to skip this in the interest of time, so I think we can, uh, we can get to questions and, uh, and on to the rest of the day. But uh, I really appreciate your time. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.